Okay, so the time is 3.03 and I think it's time to start the session. Uh, while we wait for another four more people to enter into the room, I will just play the LinkedIn QR codes of our speakers today. Uh, please do use it to uh, scan on your LinkedIn account. The QR code scanner is on your right hand of the LinkedIn account. Okay, so we are live on Facebook and I think it's time to start the session. So welcome everyone to the first uh, Asian chapter Catalyst 2030, the Malaysian chapter of Catalyst 2030. Allow me to first run through a number of housekeeping rules. Uh, please keep your video on if possible, especially at the end of the session, we will need to take a group photo. And uh, if you realize some of your names are not right, so please click on your names and change your name with uh, probably also your company so that we can get, uh, we can get acquainted. Uh, please only unmute when you're speaking and be present. Please post any questions at all that you have in the chat box. We will answer them during the Q&A session. And if you have any technical difficulties with the Zoom uh, session, please do use the zoom.us slash support. And yes, enjoy the session. Okay, so now I will play, so now we will watch the Catalyst uh, introduction video played by Karina, so you can take on. Catalyst 2030 started life as a WhatsApp group among social entrepreneurs, connecting to envision real transformational change. Launched at the World Economic Forum in January 2020, it's grown into a global movement accelerating change to ensure the SDGs are reached by 2030. Fueled by passion, our 550 members working in 175 countries have collectively put in an amazing 50,000 volunteer hours, touching the lives of 2 billion people. And we're driven by values, to which we hold ourselves accountable. 2020 was a busy year, co-creating three reports with partners and producing one of our own. Inviting high-level guests to participate in the Catalyzing Change campaign, hosting fireside chats and expert hours, which will be continuing in 2021. To celebrate our achievements, together we placed our supporters in the limelight with the first Catalyst 2030 Awards for Systemic Change. With the blessing of the Dalai Lama, we celebrated finalists and winners in the following categories. Special recognition for our early supporters, individual philanthropists, donor organizations, philanthropic intermediaries, corporate organizations, by and multilateral organizations, and four regional winners in the category of national governments. And now on to Catalyzing Change Week 2021. During this social entrepreneur-led event, we bring together diverse stakeholders in over 100 sessions to showcase their systems change efforts and the best practices that can accelerate our work in pursuit of the SDGs. Okay, thank you so much to Karina for playing the video. Now, allow me to run through the agenda of the day. So, we will be starting off our Malaysian chapter launch with a few words from our chapter chair and co-chair. And this will help us to set the intentions of the Malaysian chapter. The chapter launch will continue with a video presentation of special addresses by senior officials from the government of Malaysia and CEOs of leading government agencies. This will then be followed by a short ice-breaking session for us to energize for the panel discussion. Then we will be talking to four influential social enterprises, enterprise founders and venture into the relationship of social enterprise and the Malaysian social and economic landscape. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our chapter chair, Mr. Kuhen, to say a few words. All right.
Okay, thank you, uh, Marilyn. Uh, so it's a, it's a great honor to be able to uh, uh, launch uh, the Catalyst 2030 uh, Malaysia chapter. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Jiro uh, from Catalyst 2030 for allowing us to establish this chapter in, uh, in Malaysia, which is also the fifth country chapter uh, globally and the first in ASEAN. And of course, and of course the uh, supporting team from uh, Catalyst 2030, including uh, Yvonne, uh, Susana, uh, Bram, and also uh, Corina. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, the one who has put in a lot of effort is Marilyn, who is also our executive secretary. So I would like to thank Marilyn for her utmost perseverance and also commitment in getting this chapter off uh, uh, on a good launch. And uh, besides that, a good commitment from all the senior government officials uh, who have given their support, and also our social entrepreneurs today who have joined us uh, to be part of this uh, chapter launch. Just for a quick uh, overview, this chapter will be focusing on systems change primarily, which is to engage uh, stakeholders on policy development. And that would be the prime role of Catalyst 2030 in Malaysia. So with that, I hope everyone will give us the support and not to take out much of my, uh, on the spotlight, I would like to now uh, hand it over back to Marilyn. So thank you for your attendance. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Cohen. So now we would like to invite Dr. Subarna, our co-chair of the Malaysian chapter, to say a few words. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Marilyn. Um, for the introductions. So, you know, guys, it's always very difficult to come as the second speaker after the first speaker has already said everything. <laughs> so um, I just like to welcome all of you to this launch session um, and the panel discussions that we have following the launch session. It's a great honor to be seeing a lot of my friends here uh, online with us now. And uh, I do hope, as what uh, Kuhan mentioned just now, um, Catalyst uh, 2030 Malaysia chapter will become a platform um, for all of us to collaborate and uh, to take forward uh, the social change and social impact uh, agenda here in Malaysia. So we look forward to working with all of you. Uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, we are always happy to collaborate, yeah? So thank you so much again for coming. Pleasure to have all of you with us today. Over to you, Madeline. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Cohen and Dr. Subarna, for your insightful words that hopefully will keep our participants engaged throughout this session and look forward to our next project. So now it's time for the virtual launch video of Malaysian Chapter Catalyst 2030. We are proud to showcase the initiatives and collaborative efforts of the Malaysian government through its ministries and government agencies. Without further ado, Let's watch the video. Moments of time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. We have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path.
Ministry of Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives continues to support systems change in promoting social entrepreneurship, including the participation of social entrepreneurs in policy input and recommendations at national level. We look forward to sharing our impactful outcome at Catalyst 2030 among 195 countries and the release of our Malaysian Social Entrepreneurship Blueprint in coming months. Congratulations on the launch of the Catalyst 2030 Malaysian Chapter. The Ministry of Finance Malaysia recognises the role of social innovators and enterprises in the economy and the Ministry supports them through our annual budget allocations, mainly for ecosystem development. In addition, the Ministry recently launched a government procurement programme specifically for social enterprises, the first of its kind in this region. Congratulations on the launch of the Malaysian chapter of Catalyst 2030. We look forward to sharing our experiences and working with them on promoting social innovators and enterprises in Malaysia to advance the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we at the Ministry of Environment and Water constantly advocate for joint responsibility in mainstreaming environmental concerns into social development agenda of the nation. Hence, we are very encouraged to see activities that further augment and spur the assimilation of the Sustainable Development Goals in this country. With this, I would like to congratulate the launch of Catalyst 2030 Malaysian Chapter. Congratulations. Congratulations from the Social Security Organization Malaysia on the launch of the Catalyst 2030 Malaysian Chapter. During these challenging times following the COVID-19 pandemic, the role of Catalyst 2030 chapter become even more imperative in bringing about tangible change to ensure the Sustainable Development Goals SDG are achieved by 2030. As social security practitioners, the SDGs are close to our hearts and we are committed to providing social protection to workers in the formal and informal sectors, youth and society at large to achieve inclusive growth. We utilize innovative and creative approaches, including strategic partnerships, to expand our social safety net. Our flagship initiatives include the Return to Work program and My Future Jobs portal. Lastly, best wishes for a successful and productive Catalyzing Change Week 2021. At MDEC, we're accelerating digital development, building a digital economy that's powered by digitally skilled Malaysians, digitally empowered businesses, and digital investments. Above all else, we believe in building a digital economy that's inclusive and we're actively working towards reducing the digital divide by collaborating with various partners, especially with social enterprises. We're excited about the launch of Catalyst 2030 Malaysian chapter. So, congratulations. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Amiruddin Abdul Shukur and I am the acting CEO of MAGIC. We have recognized social innovators as a new breed of leaders, values-driven, inclusive, compassionate, entrepreneurial individuals who develop sustainable new models in business, social development, and environmental initiatives. The agility, nimbleness, and resourcefulness of social innovators goes to prove that they have a part to play, demonstrating that through a common cause Greater good puts all of us in a better place. And magic, we believe that social entrepreneurs and social innovators are the future. We have seen the transformative powers that are guided by altruistic compasses, and this is why magic is passionate advocate of social innovation. Social innovation taps the power of collaboration and partnership, bringing together public, private, and the community themselves to devise innovative solutions that our nation needs. We should not work out solutions in silo, but have that open platform and conversation to bring the right people on board and devise more effective solutions. We are blessed to be able to exist in a strong and collaborative ecosystem here in this country. From those long hours of efforts and collaborations, we have reached an efficient support system for social innovators. But we have a long way to go. Magic is active and will always 
be looking out for social innovators such as each and every one of you. In the words of Margaret Mead, a famous cultural anthropologist, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Congratulations on the launch of the Catalyst 2030 Malaysian chapter. Impact Malaysia is an initiative to spur youth development through social innovation under the purview of Ministry of Youth and Sports, KBS. We devote ourselves to nurture future leaders amongst youth in order to create meaningful social impact. Our strategic methodologies is to help catalyze, consult, create and innovate youth as well as sport-centric initiatives. On behalf of Impact Malaysia, I say congratulations on the launch of Catalyst 2030 Malaysian Chapter. Okay, thank you so much for everyone for watching our virtual launch. And now that we've heard and seen from our government on their willingness to collaborate with social enterprises in Malaysia, it's now time to discuss with our panelists the role of social enterprise in the Malaysian social and economic scene. But before that, let's have a short icebreaker to awaken the inquisitive minds in for the panel discussion. So I will share a link on the chat box please access the link and go on to the mural page and I'll explain to you how to navigate yourselves throughout the page. Hello. No, no. Hold on one second, yeah? So I realize that there is an error on the page, so I will send another link. Can you please access this code, this uh, URL? Sorry. Okay. Um. Okay, I see that people are coming in. So I would like to inform you on how to navigate yourself. So can I Okay, so this is the screen that will be projected right now. And so I see I see a few people in already. You can access the where in the world right now through the where in the world outline uh, on your pen on the panel on your right hand side so just click on it and it will go straight there so you can drag one of these uh, geotags and place it on your location now and this will help us to navigate where are you where are you right now Alternatively, you can also you can also put a sticky note on the place that you are at right now. So I'm at Slango and I will be moving my cursor towards Slango and 
double tap, it will bring me to a sticky note, which I will say Marilyn at Petaling. So I will just give you a minute to get to that. So I'll put a minute on the clock. And start the timer. If you wish that you were somewhere else around the world instead of Malaysia right now, you can also do that. You can also put a sticky note for that. Oh. Okay, so I see a lot of I see a lot of people moving and allow me to just that's Angelina and that is Mitsui who is our panelist today. She's at Ampang and I see a lot of people are at Slango. <laughs> a lot of people want to be somewhere else around the world. So yeah, that is the time. And thank you so much for participating. We, we, we shall move on to the next icebreaker game, which is... The Sailboat. So I would like to just get to know more about your take on the social enterprise scene in Malaysia. So what do you think helps to accelerate their growth and what brings them down? So an accelerator will be a win and uh, something that brings social enterprise, brings uh, forms as a hurdle will be an anchor. So just the same thing, a, stick, a sticky note and your words on what will be The wind and the anchor. So I'll put another minute on the clock. So put in your answers as fast as possible. Just give your honest and candid feedback on what helps social enterprises in Malaysia. You can say passion. I see passion there. I see process. And Yes, um, keep the answers coming and purpose. It may be personal, it may be something that is that holds back the company itself, or something that brings up the company. It may be the government of Malaysia since you just saw the video, so you can say the government of Malaysia. So another nine minute, nine seconds. And six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, so thank you again. Thank you again for participating in this icebreaker. So I see integrity, passion, and direction as wind, process, purpose, and stability. Yes, it is difficult to find those and to move on with those. So there's funding as the wind that helps them to move and there is a very small sticky note here that I think it's supposed to say Fungsi. Okay, so thank you so much everyone for, for participating. I actually wanted to ask you to also share your mood for today. So click on the how are you feeling panel and you can tell us how are you feeling today so far that you have attended the session and you've seen the video, the launch, it is real, the catalyzing change is real. So you, what you can do is you can go to the panel at the side here, click images and write, type out how are you feeling today and say GIF, so it'll come up. If not, you can also put a sticky note for that. So I hope the instructions are clear enough. I'll start a timer for a minute and a minute and 30 seconds. Okay. So just uh, 
play around with mural and see how do you feel today? What are you feeling for the panel discussion? Are you looking forward to something? Or maybe you, you are just like back from work or you're slotting this session into in the middle of your day. So how are you feeling today? We just want to know how you're feeling. Yes, we have got a lot of excited people. Oops. A lot of smileys, a lot of inspired people we have today. A peace sign. Yes, we need peace. And yes, another 20 seconds. Just put in whatever you feel like. What is happening today? How do you feel? And that's nine, eight, seven, six. Oh, we have a jumper. Three, two, one. So yes, that is the time. Okay. So I will stop sharing my screen and come back. So now that we are all awake, so let's go into our panel discussion. I would like to first introduce the panelists for today and pose a question for all of them to answer. So today we have four panelists with us, each with a unique social enterprise and a backstory as to how they began their journey. So we'll start with Miss Zarina Ismail who is a litigation lawyer and a social entrepreneur. Is, she is a founder of Drop and Wash, an eco-friendly wet clean chain in Klang Valley. In 2019, Drop Wash received accreditation for, by the Ministry of Entrepreneurship via MAGIC as a certificate certified social enterprise for upscaling the B40s into professional textile career. Ms. Zarina also founded Go Job uh, in 2018, a job matching platform for the marginalized community, a basic social enterprise accredited by, M by MED. Uh, Ms. Zarina also helps nurture young entrepreneurs and college students, advising them on sustainable and in innovative beyond profit business models. So we have Ms. Zarina and we, have, we also have Mr. Cairo Azri who co-founded Discover Muay Thai, DMT, with a deep passion in transforming at-risk and underprivileged Malaysian youth. Mr. Azri finds himself comfortable engaging and mentoring DMT's beneficiaries with his wealth of experience in grassroots issues involving B40 communities that include urban poverty, gangsterism, drug abuse, dysfunctional family units, among others. Mr. Azri is a certified Muay Thai trainer, a certified mental toughness coach, and head of state as a certified financial planner. He was also featured in various media outlets to talk about his uh, expertise in managing youth at risk. So yes, you'll, you'll get to Mr. Azri to talk about his uh, social enterprise in a while. Uh, before that, let me also introduce Ms. Sui, who is from uh, Community Tukang Jahid, which aims to empower B40 women uh, communities and consisting of single mothers, stay-at-home mothers, and underprivileged mothers. Community Tukang Jahid provides them with upscaling sewing trading and working opportunities to earn a sustainable income through sewing orders. Ms. Yap Sui is the co-founder and CEO of Community Tukang Jayat, also known as Taylor's Community of Malaysia. Community Tukang Jayat was founded in mid-2018 when she saw the much-needed assistance to help B40 groups, but knowing that it needed to be sustainable, she designed a model to hand-sew and hand-craft corporate gifts and fashion items to sell to businesses and customers. Lastly, we have Mr. Tadasilan Rajendran, who is a co-founder and CEO of My Farm Lab, a new social venture established to empower communities through social 
to sustainable agro-technological initiatives. He began his journey in the social enterprise scene when he joined Masao Wheels and Social Enterprise as a director in 2019. After 18 years of public and community service that includes grassroots social justice movement and, so, and policy advisory as well as implementation roles in the uh, Prime Minister's Department. So we have a very diverse group of panelists today with, uh, I'm sure, a very uh, interesting story as to how did they get into this scene of social enterprise. So I would like to ask the question to all of them, starting from Ms. Zarina, as to the role of social enterprise in the Malaysian economic recovery and how has the pandemic influenced its operation and sustainability? Over to you, Ms. Zarina. Hello, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zarina. I'm the Chief Impact Officer of Drop and Wash and uh, Go Job. I run two social enterprise. Uh, hello, everybody, all change makers, uh, especially those uh, outside Malaysia. I'm so happy to see so many of you here. And uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Tanasilan, who has invited me to join this um, Catalyst uh, 2030. I'm very honored. Uh, and of course, I'm surrounded by all you best social innovators. I'm my favorite people that I love so much. And um, a little bit about uh, Drop and Wash. Um, of course, uh, Drop and Wash um, has been around since 2008. We are actually uh, an impact-driven uh, enterprise uh, who, where we hire the marginalized community into professional textile carers. So basically, we hire people from the bottom 40 of the bottom 40 itself, not from the top bottom 40, bottom 40 of the lower end. Uh, which comprises of um, the uh, rehabilitated people and um, youth at risk, similar to Masala Wheels as well, and single moms, um, transgender especially, and uh, of course the um, people who uh, come out from the prison usually that has got nowhere to go. And so basically we provide them with the safety net to come and join us and to be trained and, uh, and hopefully they live a meaningful life. Uh, just like uh, all you social entrepreneurs uh, that are actually doing a good job right now. So this industry is actually a 3 billion ringgit industry in Malaysia. And uh, it's worth a lot of billion around the world. And it's actually the world's best kept secret that uh, a lot of people do not want to get their hands into. And uh, it's, only, it's actually not, I'm not the only one who hires them. It is actually a global um, practice that we in the laundry and dry cleaning line actually hire this kind of people. In fact, in the prison itself, you will find a lot of uh, prisoners are being trained to do laundry. And of course, uh, when in the industry itself, we train them into more uh, than a simple wash, dry and fold. We go into dry cleaning and today we go into uh, eco-friendly wet cleaning. And, um, and of course, drop and wash is not your ordinary laundry. We do beyond um, dry cleaning. We are actually an expert into professional wet cleaning, which is the alternative to traditional dry cleaning. If you know or not, uh, traditional dry cleaning are very toxic. It uses a petrochemical called perk, and um, it creates uh, cancer. And of course, it pollutes the environment which uh, has been banned in uh, places in the Europe, in France and in the US. And uh, the councils in the UK are very strict uh, for people who wants to use perk basically. And in Malaysia, it has been, um, uh, we have been advocating on that. And we've been working and engaging with a lot of um, councils, municipalities, the government sectors, and of course, the uh, public at large and slowly people like uh, basically accepting it, especially and we work together with people like uh, in fact, um, the designers or so community to Kanjahit, you can actually test your uh, fabrics uh, with us, you know, um, and, and we would like to, in fact, expand more towards uh, the, the government sectors uh, because we have been working for with the uh, B2B and B2C sectors. And uh, this is our business model. But uh, towards uh, the end of um, 2019, we um, 
engage more on the community and the purpose bit of our business model because our mission is basically uh, to promote uh, sustainability, uh, not only commercially, but environmental. And we go for innovative uh, technology. So our marginalized community are not tired when they are with us. You know, they, they use all the best technology that we import from all over the world. And of course, uh, for purpose uh, full uh, mission, we, we work together and engage with all sorts of community, community leaders, NGOs, uh, corporate CSR departments, and of course, social enterprise and social entrepreneurs. So 2020 was uh, a big hit for us, and we are no longer the same person, the same social enterprise that we were before this. We, like all of you, we, we had to pivot, and um, we went into um, a very sleep mode initially because we were shut down by the uh, movement control order in 2020, where um, laundry was one of the first uh, hit. Uh, but having said that, we did not uh, sleep because it's, if you snooze, you lose, basically. And uh, so we didn't do that. It didn't take us long after, call it after you know, we uh, managed our staffing. Uh, we had to restructure our, our people, our facilities, our resources. And we made full use of our facilities by, you know, using our space, our vans, our people, and engage into a community drive where we went into a food aid delivery, where we were supported by our corporate sector, our NGOs, and our and we collaborated with many social enterprises, and we went into a hundred percent drive. Uh, to go into food aid delivery as uh, we also won uh, two grants at the same time uh, with Yasan Hasana and also partly from Magic for, for bringing in um, uh, innovative uh, measures to our operations at that time. So we managed uh, in 2020, basically we have um, basically saved about 40,000 garments from toxic chemicals. Uh, but at the same time, we also managed to hit our target of 5,000 families beneficiaries to uh, which we uh, gave food aid in terms of dry food, in which when we first launched our project Food for V40, we actually uh, managed to register about 1,000 people who applied for the food aid, basically. And um, of course, we engage with many many communities thereafter because we couldn't we couldn't take in any more application by by putting up the the uh, registration because there was too many of them and of course we also targeted those who did not receive the uh, monetary aid by the government at that time so during that uh, covid period uh, initial covid period in march 2020 uh, towards the six months after there were many people who lost their job who were sickly and um, and who simply did not receive the monetary grant from the government. So we went into the community drive where we worked together with other social enterprises like Masala Wheels and also Discover Motai brought in uh, volunteers to go into all the um, PPR uh, community, which in I think in overseas is called the council flats. Yeah. Uh, so those are all the uh, bottom 40 communities that live there. So we went, um, we went there to basically to support their, their, um, their, their needs and, and, and safety nets basically. So basically what we, what we need uh, right now is uh, to me, it is a bigger perspective that uh, we need to look on and that um, you know, as a social enterprise, we need to go into industrial relations, uh, 4.0, you know, bring in more new technology. We hope that we can have more procurement from the government, from the uh, uh, corporate sector, bring in more R&D for us, you know, and uh, bring in new green technology because we are big on, on, on green, green effects. And uh, of course, um, we want uh, a sharing economy with all these, is that the time speed? Okay, with, uh, sorry, uh, with a uh, sharing economy between all sorts of parties because um, it's, it's no longer about us alone. It's no longer about 
about us and our customers and our clients and communities, but it's a sharing economy with every parties. And uh, that's how we, uh, as a group of uh, change maker, must, uh, can be sustainable, basically. And uh, this will also include um, uh, multiple impact on, on all sectors, not only our beneficiaries, but us and, and everybody to, to be sustainable at the same time, yeah. So, uh, and thank you to the government as well to uh, bring in procurement, uh, which is a very good note on, on, on our part because it has been very lacking for the past uh, for how many years and, we, and that's something that we really need. And uh, of course, you know, um, as a sustainable um, social enterprise, not only we rely on procurement, that maybe about 10 to 20%, we still rely on our grants and some donations to support our operation here. So thank you, Marilyn, and I hope that's been so insightful and uh, thank you everyone. Have a good uh, Catalyst Week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Zarina. It was really insightful into what does a social enterprise actually need to move forward from uh, what assistance do we need from the government to move forward from this stage? So can we please hear from Mr. Azri now as to your take on this question? Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, hi, my name is Kairul Azri. You guys can just call me Azri. I'm from Discover Muay Thai. So thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for spending your time in, in, uh, for this event. And congratulations again, Catalyst 2030, for the successful launch. Um, so what Discover Muay Thai is, we are a social enterprise um, that develops or empowers at-risk and underprivileged youth in Malaysia through martial arts and alternative education. So what we do basically, um, since 2015, we have been engaging um, at-risk youth. By the term at-risk youth means in Malaysia, uh, those who are you know, from vulnerable groups of, of uh, families and so on. So we take them in at our academy for four months. So what they do in the academy, we train the Muay Thai. If you guys know the, the art, the martial art of Muay Thai, it's from Thailand. Um, and I'm sure all martial arts um, um, encourages the disciples to do the same, which they encourage the, the values of respect, discipline, and, and many others. So through Muay Thai, it's, it's, it's like a tool to rope them, you know, uh, as, as uh, be, become to, to be part of the um, participants. But apart from Muay Thai, the majority of um, their routine involves um, uh, skills development and for example we have a basic English class we have uh, moral studies we have um, gym management we have entrepreneurship classes and so on and so forth um, with the hope that after the four months these guys at least um, achieve a, a basic um, you know they they, they, uh, they have a, a routine um, that can uh, they, they can be independent post academy so the three outcomes that we are looking at post academy is one they earn income either directly with discover muay thai as trainers muay thai trainers or um, with our employment partners secondly if they have potential in the muay thai scene um, we groom them further to become a national athlete and also lastly we want them for those who dropped out of schools for example um, at the age of 16 17 and after the academy they realize that you know it, it uh, the awareness of education is important we will help them in pursuing their um, their studies back into school or even higher le level education uh, so those are the three outcomes that we want to uh, assist our beneficiaries and after five years alhamdulillah we have um, successfully empowered uh, 32 beneficiaries from the academy and thousand others from our um, indirect uh, programs uh, sorry uh, in our uh, site programs that impacting um, other group of uh, youth as well. So coming back to your question, Marilyn, on the role of Malaysian SE in uh, the economic recovery, right? I guess um, as a social enterprise, we are dealing with grassroots issues, as Puan Zarina uh, eloquently mentioned just now. And I think with the pandemic, it, it somehow you know, uh, made things worse uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but for the MT, um, we, we feel that it's um, in the initial stage, we were very, very down because as you guys know, Muay Thai, it's a, it's a contact sport. Um, all gyms are closed down. We cannot operate same as, as Ponzarina. Um, we, we were paralyzed, you know, um, uh, for the first, uh, at least one month. 
And then again, uh, we didn't snooze. Uh, we 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 get back on the on uh, on our uh, on the drawing board, and immediately we came up with a, with a, a backup plan. So, uh, which I will explain uh, later on. But during the pandemic, uh, some of the activities that Discover Muay Thai have have managed to um, to. Um, initiate and also assist some of our fellow social enterprise, including uh, Kazarina and 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 Silen. Um, firstly, we we mobilize our beneficiaries uh, because we have all these troops of 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 manpowers, right? Um, they are also they don't have jobs since all our gyms are closed. Our personal training engagements are uh, we cannot you know implement the personal training uh, at all. So we decided to mobilize this, this um, our 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 boys, uh, our trainers, and uh, facilitate um, uh, food distribution efforts by our fellow um, um, partners. For example, Drop and Wash, they have food distribution at the PPR area, at the uh, low cost housing areas, and we have other partners who have similar um, arrangements. So we get these boys to really go out and contribute back the energy very the least. So that's number one. Number two, we um, conducted this um, job matching program together with our another NGO, uh, Sisterhood Alliance, um, supported by Yayasan Harta Lega. Uh, it's called Bold. So this job matching is not just any job matching program. Um, it's it it's it's a it's a plug and play kind of training. So they train for three days and two nights. Um, you know the modules include again communication, uh, goal setting. It's basically bringing up back their motivation and everything. And right after they uh, they train for three days and two nights, um, they are placed uh, with our employment partners who are who really in need of of, of um, employees, especially in F&B industries. You know, in the pandemic, they are still running and and, and so on. So um, that's uh, another initiative that we have been uh, working on with partners um, internally. Um, Discover Muay Thai. Uh, our own effort, our own business operation. Since the gym is closed, personal training can uh, is, is not allowed. Um, we it, we didn't pivot entirely of the whole business model. We just add up a new um, revenue stream that we feel uh, during the pandemic is is very uh, useful for 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 people. So we moved to online training where we introduced, you know, um, our basic Muay Thai course online. Even though, you know, there are voices in our head, you know, saying that, hey, you know, in YouTube, people can, can easily access, you know, they can just search in Google and everything. What, but we believe uh, Malaysians, um, you know, they will support us. So Alhamdulillah, um, Two months into the 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 uh, development of the content, because you know, um, at, during the pandemic, we were in the midst of um, engaging our uh, fourth batch, so we stopped right in the middle, and some of them have to go back, and some of them stayed at the gym. So during the two months, we 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 uh, I personally directed them to you know have uh, you know uh, over over Google Meet. Uh, you know on how they have to stand on on the on the on the on the modules and so on and so forth. So, um, but again, um, once we launch um, during the first month, we managed to to get um, five figures, um, which is quite. Uh, 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 we were overwhelmed by the response, and it has been sustainable up until today. So that's in terms of business for Discover Muay Thai on how we sustain. So all this money again, it goes back to the academy. It goes back to our beneficiaries, and they will have um, 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 certain income um, for their um, for their own for their self and also a uh, family. And lastly, I would like to share. Um, I guess the uh, the blessing in these guys that I was mentioning earlier for this pandemic is that um, uh, recently, Discover Muay Thai we just um, opened our new branch um, in Seti Alam. So for those in Malaysia, uh, we have a new branch in Seti Alam. We haven't officially launched it yet, but we just um, soft launch. Um, this is due to the effort that we see from our beneficiary uh, from batch three. This guy, this boy, uh, his name is Azme. Um, so all this while he has been using his own house, training the youth around his, his um, housing areas in Meru Klang. So, after a while, I've observed this and we, we, we decided that, okay, let's support this guy and, you know, 
post pandemic not post pandemic lah i mean we are still in the pandemic you know once mco has has um, subsided and everybody can go out that's the uh, our gym has gotten you know double the the membership you know people were you know uh, at house for three months four months right so they want to uh, go out and enjoy so we received quite a over, overwhelming um, memberships so we decided hey let's open a new um, a new place but again it's not just a muay thai you know where customers come and and train muay thai it's going to be also a mini satellite gym where our academy in jalan alo is the the hq the main one but from our beneficiaries uh, from batch 1 until batch 5 we have a lot of participants coming from klang area which is for malaysians you guys know it is very high risk and black area around klang um so having a, a mini uh, gym a mini satellite center at klang or seti alam uh, would somehow further um, 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 our um, social efforts into addressing the youth um, over there so i guess and and the the beautiful thing about this is the one that is leading and managing that particular center is one of our beneficiaries from batch 3 azmi and also his friends who are from the academy as well and also surrounding areas so it's really really empowering to see him managing the center and uh, being empowered and earning income being independent so that's what we hope um, in the long run discover muay thai would um, Uh, develop further and also contribute to the economy especially in the industry of uh, martial arts and fitness industry and eventually um, you know we grow into other industries as well so yeah that's 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 about this kind of thing thank you everybody for for your time and listening to to, to my stories thank you thank you so much uh, mr azri we are so happy to hear that you have opened up a new uh, a new branch despite all the struggles that you've gone through and something is very beautiful to see is that the the pandemic actually brought the social enterprises together and Ms. Zarina was able to collaborate with uh, the Sao Muay Thai and multiple other social enterprises it's nice to see that you're able to pull each other up and make sure that your goals are still being met uh, so now I'd like to invite Ms. Sui he's also a uh, tell us about your perspective on the role of social enterprise in Malaysia and how does the pandemic influence this sustain its sustainability thank you hi good afternoon everyone thanks again for having me and on behalf of KTG i just want to say congratulations on the launch of Catalyst 2030 the Malaysian chapter um so yeah uh, thanks for having me okay so back to your question i guess um our role is that i from what we don't know is that Malaysian in the S- the SE scene is actually very small and not yet matured i'm very sure it's matured on many other countries but in Malaysia social enterprise this term itself is like a new dna um many people i mean of course the agencies the policy makers the people involved in this group they understand they hear it all again over and over again of what a social enterprise is but when we talk to a layman they have zero clue they say oh are you just an ngo Um, so I guess you know our role is that when we come in, uh, we have to. There's this um, responsibility that we hold to actually educate the ecosystem as well to understand that why is social enterprise even put in place and why are we even now more so more prominent and more needed? Um, I guess because people realize that the NGOs are doing what they they already have been designed to do, but there's so much burden on them because it always comes to a limit. But so then a social enterprise comes into play because we're In a, in a way, we're designed to be sustainable, and I guess that's the whole topic of today: is that how can we be sustainable? So that's why I'm really glad that this Catalyst 2030 is launched because it's bringing the right entity all together, especially like the social enterprises, the agencies, the government the ministries, and and the grassroots. Right? Uh, I guess we play a role because we are right now going to the grassroots. We see the issues that are, what's being faced. I think once Irina, as we all can say the same, is that you know we see the We see the real troubles that's going on, and sometimes from above, we assume that you know some small thing can help them, but we know that it's not going to last very long. It's an immediate solve solution effect, but it's not going to be a long term um, solving their issues, right? So I guess uh, having this platform is a really good place for all of us to come together. So really glad that there's this launch, um, and also you know like the the whole like you said when you were asking me the question is that what's my perspective as the role of an SE in Malaysia is that our role is to educate 
um, we have a lot to do. We are, we are not yet matured in this industry. We have to let whole Malaysia know that why is the SE important? Why corporates should also understand uh, why is it important to support an SBS, SE as well? Um, and yeah, so how the economy, um, like just to come back, I guess I haven't really introduced what KDG is about. So sorry, I just straight away jumped in. Uh, so Committee to Gang Jahid, what we do is that we empower the B40 group of Malaysia, consisting of single mothers, stay-at-home women, um, the underprivileged women. But technically, um, beyond that, I don't want to just, you know, categorize them as B40. For us, we want to empower women. Any woman who just wants to sow, earn an income from home. So generally, they don't want to just rely on the husband's income, but they want to support the family as well. So how we distribute jobs for them is that we take sewing jobs, we upskill them, teach them how to make corporate gifts, get these ladies to take home this item, sew it at home, and then later bring it back to us for QC, and then we pack it and deliver to our corporate clients. So how this all started was uh, actually truly by accident. We were, I started out starting a fashion company thinking that, you know, I want to empower fashion designers to curate their designs. But I realized that, you know, by curating the designs, I need a manufacturing factory, right? But no one would do my orders because it was too big. It, it, the orders they wanted was too big and I only wanted like 10 pieces, 20 pieces. So then, so, so to just share with our global audience is that the machi machi, which means the aunties, the tailors in our neighborhood, they tend to take orders from our, you know, our own circle of friends to do like clothings for festive seasons. Like, you know, for Hari Raya, they would do like one piece, two piece of Bajukuro. So then I would outsource these jobs to these ladies, these neighborhood tailors. And then when I realized that, you know, they wanted more and more orders, their friends started seeking out for orders. And then the, 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 the word of mouth just spread all around and then people wanted orders from KDJ. So that's where we realized, you know, there's this hidden gap that no one's really empowering these ladies of the household to give them a job because they are at home, they need to take care of the household, the children 24 um, seven, they need to cook, they need to clean, they need to be at home all the time. So they cannot clock in into um, a factory or into a workplace of a nine to five. So that's where we realized that we're actually assisting this group of uh, women who are situated at home, but who wants to earn an income and are committed to do so. So we're very glad that, you know, for, like I think, what Azri shared is that it is a blessing in disguise because uh, when the pandemic happened, more and more ladies came to us because their husbands lost their job. And then we were then struggling. At first, of course, at first we were struggling. How do we find jobs for them to sustain? Um, but thankfully, you know, with the pandemic going on, there were people looking for masks. So that's how we started sewing face masks. And with that, we were very glad that even during the first few months, we had a 16,000 piece order. And then that's how we distributed out to almost about 50 ladies. Yeah, so it was, um, and these ladies managed to actually earn an income of about 200 to 300 a week. So, I mean, that was already an access to, I mean, an extra income for them to put food on the table, especially when if they have six children and the husband lost a job. So any sort of income helps. So then uh, at the same time, I guess the, one of the good story that, you know, like what Azri shared about how your beneficiaries are now benefiting others. Um, similarly, we have a single mom that was with us. And then she then grouped a whole group of single mothers who, who had no job but needed to earn an income. They were earning almost up to 1,005 per week, just sewing face masks. So then they were like really helping out like four to five families themselves, not just themselves, but helping five other families. So I guess like I really like the synergy in this group is because uh, KTJ was also blessed with the opportunity to work with Masala Wheels. So we did that for Raya. And then to hear that Drop and Wash is now working with uh, Discover Muay Thai. So I can see that, you know, like what you said, the real work is collaborating to achieve SDG. I think that's what we're already doing naturally without knowing. We're just like, hey, shall we collab? Because now I want to, you know, approach another beneficiary group. And I think that as part of my, 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 my order that could, you know, assist or my supply chain that could outsource to you guys. So when we do that, that's like creating a whole ecosystem of helping one another at, a, at the same time. And it's being sustainable. So I, yeah, I guess um, that's, that's what is being kickstarted right now. It's really good to see that. I feel, I hope that, also, thanks to this forum that, you know, uh, we get the ministries and agencies to see how we can actually work together in the long run and look at long-term sustainability effects rather than a short-term uh, handout or a short-term just to solve a, an issue or a KPI or a number. 
right? We're here to actually solve a long-term problem and to actually uplift uh, communities together. So yeah, that's my sharing. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Back to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Louis. It's actually what I've seen so far from what has been shared. It is interesting how social enterprises come about. You, you realize that there's a need for something and you build a model around the need. And since you're building a model around the need, it's more effective and it, it, it helps to solve more problems in the long run. Like how you, you spoke about the, the housewife who was able to help 10 other housewives. That is amazing. It, it is sharings like this that helps social enterprises to actually move and uh, keep going. And another thing that I would like to ask all the participants, if you have any questions at all, please post them in the, uh, in the chat box below. I'll get to them after after we speak to Mr. Tanasilet. So over to you, Mr. Tanasilet. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the uh, uh, members of the Catalyst family and change makers from uh, around the globe. Uh, I want to thank the Global Catalyst 2030 movement and uh, the newly established Malaysian chapter for the opportunity given for me to speak today. Now, uh, just a quick background before I move, move on to uh, answer the question that Marilyn posted. Um, so in 2018, when I left the Malaysian civil service, I was looking for a purpose in life. How do I continue being uh, purposeful in life? And uh, that's when my friend Puhan invited me to, uh, to join Masala Wills. So I literally went to an institution of uh, social entrepreneurship to learn um, uh, what is it like to impact lives. And um, with that experience, uh, in the, and that too in the midst of the pandemic, I've learned quite a lot. And uh, that was the driving factor for me to also start a, a, a venture or, a, or an initiative on my own uh, with the support of a few uh, like-minded friends. And uh, that's how uh, uh, the uh, barely one month old My Farm Lab took shape, uh, you know, with the support of my partners at Masala Wills and my friends and uh, a strong institutional support from, uh, uh, from a foundation, MySkills Foundation, the CEO is present here today as well. So, you know, we collaborated to make this venture happen and uh, although we are one month old, we have visions, we have our plans and we have our, our aim and what we exactly wanted to do. And I keep saying this as a broken record that we are here to, uh, we are not here to compete, we are here, we are here to complement and uh, to collaborate with the ecosystem players towards uh, impacting lives. Uh, so that's a bit of a background about who am I and uh, what this uh, farm lab does and uh, the uniqueness of me wearing two caps here today, half Masala Wills and half my farm lab. Right, uh, and of course, uh, to answer Marilyn's question, uh, it feels great to be the last speaker because most of my colleagues have spoken pretty much all the points I wanted to speak. So, um, uh, so I'd like to try start with this uh, this one statement. You know, uh, social enterprises are like the minority community and sometimes like the marginalized community. Uh, well, not all, but most of them struggle for visibility and for their voices to be heard. Uh, when it comes to business. Uh, all hits turn to big players like the MNCs, GLCs, uh, corporations, or the high flying SMEs. When it comes to social and community development, the first thing that comes to anyone's mind is NGOs. Right? And on top of this, we have management consultants dictating upon us on what and how we should conduct our business without having, ha without having any idea of the magnitude of impact that we create daily. Right? Uh, we watched in the, two, in the second video earlier. Uh, senior officials and the CEOs of uh, Malaysian government departments and agencies speak of initiatives in support of uh, SE ecosystem. But let me remind you that this did not happen magically or overnight. Uh, it was the fruit of a long and uh, consistent labor of effort put in by the uh, pioneer ecosystem players. And um, having said that, there's much more that needs to be done. Uh, my point here is that there has to be a policy sustainability and a sustainable implementation of such policies. Right? Sustainability needs sustainable policies, is what I'm trying to say. Because um, why? why is the concern, you may ask. Um, when governments change, policies change. When people change, priorities change. And uh, we will have to start the whole process all over again. And uh, well, sorry to say that we are a nation famous for our blueprints and reprints. And uh, when changes happen, such documents are shelved to collect dust. Right? And um, so in order, so there are, a lot of roles the SEs can play for the recovery of the economy, but then the environment must be enabling enough for them to do so. Uh, and when we, when SEs uh, seek support from the government, it doesn't always mean monetary in nature. 
this is the perception that uh, uh, that people have generally that you know we are out here like uh, Suyi mentioned earlier, right? People often mistake us as NGOs, and uh, when we approach them for support or collaboration, we, they think that we're here for uh, donations and, and financial support. Same goes to the government. It took it took a lot of time for us to even explain to them who we are and what we do, and um, and then you know combat this this perception that we are only here for money. You know, sometimes this uh, this kind of support can come in the form of uh, avenues to complement and uh, strengthen government initiatives, or uh, you know, for better targeting towards actual people that have been truly devastated, both economically and financially. You know, SCs also have a better uh, on the ground uh, realistic view of uh, what selected disadvantaged communities have gone through and uh, what they will need to sustain and grow during this period. Uh, and the pandemic is a testament to this. Uh, like my colleagues have shared earlier, uh, the SCs were among the first respondents to the needs of communities that suffered the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's amazing how uh, during the most testing time, uh, we could pull together our resources and collaborate to reach out to as many people as possible who needed assistance. I remember vividly working with uh, uh, Bojok, uh, Azri and whatnot, you know, that we're in, in reaching out to the uh, to the people in the PPR communities and whatnot. You know, it was a risk that we took because the pandemic was really hitting us hard. Cases were high. And we, you know, champions took the risk of going into all those places where the cases were high to, to give provisions and food and whatnot. You know, that was um, that was some some kind of an experience that, you know, that, uh, that you know, will never be, I'll never forget those experience. Now at Masala Wills, and this is where I wear my uh, Masala Wills hat, I remember this period was a defining uh, defining moment in our six years of existence. It was uh, no longer a business as usual. Uh, I remember a call from Kuhan one evening to share his concern and uh, bounce off ideas on how we're going to mitigate the impact of a, lack of a lockdown. And that in itself resulted in Masala Wills mobilizing a massive movement to raise nearly 26,000 meals and 400 provision supplies for poor households, uh, frontliners, students, and uh, uh, refugee communities, among others. And all this was done through an innovative uh, paid forward campaign. We worked with government agencies uh, and grassroots movements to identify the people uh, who needed help. And uh, we reached out to them with the support of some 80 stakeholders. So it was quite a massive, massive collaborative effort that we we were able to pull through in the mid of a pandemic. And it is also during this pandemic that we were able to empower um, more youth over and over and above the at-risk youth that we have been empowering all this while and create new micro entrepreneurs, uh, you know, with job placement and business startups. Uh, it was a tough moment, uh, but we sailed through it. We sailed through the rough weather with our quick decisions uh, that enabled our sustainability. And we continue to do so with or without the support of funds and grants. Uh, My Farm Lab, on the other hand, uh, was established, like I said, during the pandemic. And uh, we wanted to complement and support uh, the ecosystem uh, by ensuring uh, food sustainability uh, and uh, imparting skills to our beneficial community, which we generally categorize as those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Right? The, the, the pool is quite big. We don't want to leave, leave anyone out. And therefore, we have decided to Call them such so that we can uh, we can uh, uh, reach out to and impact as many lives as possible, and all these skills is for them to use for the rest of their lives. Now these models that uh, we have discussed and uh, you know as, as put forward by Ponzarina, Azri, and uh, Sui, you know can and must be adopted as a, as a larger scale uh, for the economic growth. Now, as is being part of governmental and non-governmental policy creation would allow. Uh, but enhance economy recovery for the country and communities. Now we can be the magnifying glass, if you like it, or the funnel for a better and targeted economic assistance, and we can aid in policy creation. Uh, so this is something I believe uh, the Catalyst 2030 movement in Malaysia will champion as uh, part of its system change agenda uh, with the support of the global Catalyst team and local ecosystem players. Uh, so many thanks to the, Catalyst, to the global uh, Catalyst 2030 movement uh, for recognizing the work we do here in Malaysia and uh, for giving us the platform to collaborate and uh, learn from each other. Uh, congratulations to the um, Malaysian chapter of which I'm a proud member for this new beginning. Uh, I'm looking forward to giving my best and um, well, let's work together in the, uh, to make a difference in the lives of those around us. Thank you and over, back, over to you, Marilyn. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Sealand, for the very, very insightful and very well articulated answer. 
So uh, now we actually have a question in the chat box that I would like to pose to one of the uh, panelists that we have today. So a question by Fazi is, what is the main motivating factors of, a social, of the CEOs and the founders of social enterprises to be sustainable during the pandemic? Is there a connection between motivation and sustainability? Can one of the panelists please take the question? Um, I can answer okay. that. I'll try and answer that. Okay, Marley? Yes, thank you. Marley? I'll take the answer. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's actually Captain Faiz. Uh, uh, he's actually, uh, he just wrote a very good article about sustainability on uh, SE as well, which uh, you all can uh, PM me to, I can share the link. Or Captain Faiz, maybe you can actually share the link over in this group as well. Yeah, I think the main factor for me is we cannot lose our beneficiaries who needs us uh, to be sustainable for them to be sustainable. So that's, that's the key factor for me, at least I don't know about others. So that actually motivates me to be alive and think of any way that I can uh, to make sure that um, our operations and movement go on. And, and, and when they are, when we motivate them, they, they feel more motivated to, to be around. And I am very proud to, to know that, um, you know, uh, to see that uh, we didn't, you know, during, during lockdown March 2020 to December, we did not uh, remove any beneficiaries. Neither did we, uh, you know, uh, reduce their salary at that time. Only towards the end of uh, December to January this year, we had to reduce some of the salary because otherwise we need to cut down on, on people. And they the one who come, uh, come to me that boss that, you know, rather than you uh, remove us totally, why don't we work alternate day or something like that? And they were like basically still around till today. So this is something that I'm, I'm pretty proud of my own uh, people and team that they still stick around and, and make sure that um, we run as a team basically. Yep. Okay, Dr. Captain okay. Faiz. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Zarina, for that uh, answer. It's actually interesting to see how social enterprises, when they work as a business, they tend to be more reasonable towards their employees and follow better labor laws. And it's it's great to see that you are you are following uh, you are being more more approachable towards your employees. So another question from the chat box is. Uh, by Mr. Jason Jacob, if you could change one aspect within your development, what would it be in what would it be in the process of support for your business communities? Why would you change it and do it again regarding social impact? Can I answer this? Yes, please. Okay, um, this is from Discover Muay Thai's perspective. Uh, one thing that would, um, I wish we could have not to totally to say change, but we could have done earlier, way earlier, maybe even during um, the start of our um, 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 establishment is that to really adopt technological um, tools, you know, um, as our um, part of our, you know, business operation um, and so on and so forth. So having this pandemic now, forced us to really adapt and you know um, migrate to you know using all these platforms um, e-commerce platform although we have done um, you know a, a bit of uh, studies and there are plans there were plans in in place to somehow move to online um, 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 tools but it was not um, successfully implemented because of you know the overwhelming um, um, work that we are doing on ground and as well as you know um, business networking you know um, um, addressing stakeholders and so on and so forth so with uh, since we are very small so we we didn't employ we we, we, we we were very comfortable at our current size so bam pandemic happened it it somehow forced us to you know, uh, you know, you to 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 survive and um, learn. You know, as we go along, we learn on how to use the 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 all these 
tools um, available. And from then on, um, I think for the past few months, we have constantly adapting um, so many um, 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 softwares, all these um, tools um, for ease of operation for Discover Muay Thai. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Mr. Cairo. So um, I have another question from Mr. Kuhan to that I would like to direct to Ms. Sui. So the question is, what is the most important policy support that you look forward to from the government of Malaysia and why? Oh, definitely, I wanted to take this question as well. <laughs> um, I, okay, I think it's a very valid question. First and foremost, first I have to thank, um, there are ministries and there are agencies already taking on SEs very seriously. For one is MAGIC, for the second is MEDA and MOSTI. They are involving um, SEs into, the, into their blueprint, I would say. And also there are other ministries that are adopting, like thank you Ministry of Finance for even adopting the idea of having the procurement set out just for SE as a, first in, right? So that gives us an opportunity to actually showcase ourselves. But I think one most important thing is that, okay, having now this Catalyst uh, as a forum, I guess what if we could actually have this opportunity to actually share what we do. For example, there are initiatives that were launched, but were not executed to the right people. Um, how do I put it is that when there was this, I think some, a few of my SE friends here knows this, there was moments whereby we were supposed to end a, attend an event. The event was supposed to have all the ministries and the key persons involved to come in and see what do we have to offer. But there was one thing missing. Those weren't the key person. They were just sending in somebody to show face. The key person there isn't somebody who makes the decision, decides or even sees whether it's, are we, are we applicable to their direct um, uh, direct industry or not. So if it's possible, I mean, whether it's something that we can even foresee in the future is that could every ministry have one key person looking at sustainability? And can this key person actually make a decision? Or is this person just put there to report, but then in the end of the day, they're just going to procure it from a bigger factory who makes it cheaper, uh, buy it from a mass production, which is you know more cost effective. We understand cost is always the end of the the you know and the end result of everything but you know if we want to look at sustainability being one of the core change we have to work together and speak to the right people most of the time uh, when they are trying to connect the gap the gap always always um, I, I don't know how to explain but it just always there's always this uh, missing piece because we're not speaking to the right people and then the next thing that if if it's even possible is that okay I understand that there's this new uh, new thing just to share, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure how it works really, but there's this new term called say no, no gift policy, for example. But if KTJ, as what we do as a product, we show products, right? And uh, just to share very honestly is that when people hear the idea of SE, the immediate thought is that we're of a sub, sub standard. We're not high standard, we're not high quality. Our, our items are just to help Another, uh, another community. So tend to be the mindset and the stigma is that we produce low quality items. But I'm very sure Masala Wheels comes up with perfect dishes and we come up with high quality items, right? Uh, you guys can't even say that. I, I super agree with that. But then again, we don't have the opportunity to actually display, to showcase, to, 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 that, to then be identified as whether can we produce such quality. So if there is like a, a chance whereby, you know, we can come together, let, having Catalyst 2030 to be our engine, to, to actually allow the, the social enterprises and the ministries and the, and the agencies to come together and let us show you our products without having the no gift policy in, in, in place, you know what I mean? Because it's very sensitive. Let, let, let's say if let's say KTJ would like to send an item to actually show, like, look, look, this is the items that our tailors can do. And these are Malaysian handmade products, 100% from Malaysia. But how can I do so without stepping on the wrong toes? So I guess uh, when it comes to this kind of policy, uh, hopefully, um, maybe with Catalyst 2030, we can see a bit of change, um, see how we can voice, um, how we can help each other out. These are small little changes, but I understand in the end of the day, if we don't have to keep us on changing it, um, it's always going to drop back to square one. So yeah, I hope it answers your question. Thank you. Yes, it it definitely does. It is it's important that uh, government agencies that organize this kind of initiatives they should 
be in close connection with social enterprises so that they can understand what is needed. For example, your request for to revoke the no gift policy, it is very relatable and it could not have been uh, it, it would not have been addressed to them if it was not for you addressing it right now so another question to mr sealand before we wrap up in another seven minutes i have another two more questions so one question to mr sealand first uh, how do you foresee social enterprises playing a role in cultivating agricultural interest among youths this is by miss menaga one of our interns at masala wheels who is also working on the urban farming project. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, okay, so to answer that question, first, um, agriculture is often seen as the uh, uh, one of the least favorite uh, profession among the younger generation. Uh, okay, like, you know, they call it a dirty job or whatnot, right? because it requires you to uh, work in the hot sun, uh, touch the soil and whatnot. But uh, that is no longer what agriculture is all about. Agriculture has, has, has evolved. And uh, there are a lot of uh, new innovative concepts behind agriculture. And uh, I think where SEs play a role is, is educating the youths that, you know, uh, that there's changes are happening, technology is coming in, and, um, and it's about, it's, it's look at it as a profession rather than looking at it as a, uh, a stopgap measure, for example, right? Uh, we have read stories about how bank offices have turned uh, into farmers, uh, how lawyers, I, have, uh, I know some lawyers who uh, have, left the, have, to, have, have left the practice and uh, started farming. Right, and uh, so it's becoming it's becoming an, a, a, a new sector with interesting uh, interesting uh, scope and uh, uh, fruitful outcome, and um, so in this in this context, social enterprises literally will have to educate and will have to uh, uh, show them that you know uh, there is there is a, there is a lot of opportunities, and when I mean opportunities, it doesn't does not limit it's not limited to uh, to a job or an income. But also as leadership, imagine youth starting starts uh, setting up uh, uh, social enterprises in the agriculture sector, like what we just did recently. And uh, you'll be amazed behind behind the team behind my farm lab. None of us, none of us have any, uh, uh, um, uh, none of us were farmers before, or didn't come from such a generation. You know, our chairman is a biotechnologist, and uh, and. Uh, we decided, you know, that you know, we we all need to eat and we all need to survive, and uh, there needs to be a food security in this, uh, uh, especially during this era of pandemic and whatnot. And we we look back at what we are passionate about. Our passion is we like to grow things. We like to grow people, and that's how the idea of uh, farming, urban farming, came into our mind. And uh, uh, we looked at uh, looked at products that uh, that uh, can uh, can excite people, excite our participants, our beneficiaries, and uh, which is why we specifically chose. Uh, agricultural products that that is uh, that can drive high revenue and whatnot, and uh, and uh, and uh, can um, uh, excite again. The, the key here is exciting them, exciting them with all the opportunities that uh, that farming has to offer, agriculture has to offer. Um, so that's the uh, well, that's very much the role I think the social enterprises can play. You know, you are creating creating a, a, a building leaders in them, setting up an entity for them and then championing the social mission that you want to champion. Hope that answers the question, Managa. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Seelan. So I have another question, a very relevant and something that might be in everyone's minds when, when the topic of pandemic came up just now. So do you think that social enterprise should be regulated in relations to ensure that beneficiaries will uh, beneficiaries' well-being are being taken care of if the SE doesn't work. So, does anyone uh, would anyone like to take up this question? Okay, How about I can answer that. Yes, okay. thank you so much. I think uh, the human resource uh, laws in uh, or rather employment laws in the in Malaysia is pretty water watertight at the moment. Uh, but it's just that um, I think most of SEs, uh, some of us are still not um, sustainable yet. So there are different kind of um, um, employment terms that they can engage or, or, or term it with the, with the uh, beneficiaries, maybe on a project basis, for example. 
but otherwise i i feel that um, the regulation is pretty watertight under our employment laws already yeah and uh, we have the soxo we have the etf all that you know and um, so yeah so it, i don't think there's there's a need anymore to be regulated in terms of the beneficiaries uh, well because it's already been covered on by the existing laws that we have here. Um, can I add just a little? Yeah, please. Uh, do. Maybe, uh, maybe yeah, sure. because KD, KDG is a little different. Is that uh, I'm not sure how 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 will we probably some policies can change or can help us. Is that KDG is a bit different because we give like you said project basis, right? Uh, we give project basis like sewing to per lady and each lady takes a different amount home. So when we, it's a piecemeal, which means whatever they sow, they get paid. So some ladies have been with us for three years, but then when we sit down with a lot of them, uh, we did ask like 50 of them, like what is it next beyond job opportunity and beyond earning an income? What would they want to improve their welfare? And many of them did say EPF, so, so and insurance. So what KTJ did with whatever we could with our low resources, we just find out as much as we could, how could we, get them EPFs or so or insurance. And we found out there was a lot of hurdles in this because EPF and so-so requires employment. Um, it needs to be a monthly basis, but whereas our tailors are by job basis, so we couldn't start an account or a saving for them. So we couldn't look at EPF or so-so as an option. And then the third one was that insurance. So that's the best we could do. So KTJ's uh, 2021 goal was that we actually uh, started up a subsidy fund for five or three of our tailors to actually get insurance. So we know that their, 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 their premium will be super high. So we actually spoke to one of our very good agencies that actually can give them a good premium. But KTJ will be subsidizing 80% for them. So, um, but only because they have achieved certain factors, for example, they are very committed. They've been doing very well. They've been even training other ladies. They've been sharing their knowledge after we've trained them. So, of course, we, we set aside different, um, different factors of who, which lady can we actually subsidize. But that's the maximum we could do. But I guess, um, yes, I'm not certain how the employment um, paradigm can change in that sense. But um, many of them did want a certain way of how can they say for the and so so. But knowing the policy couldn't change that, we didn't look further. So I'm not sure, but just something to bring up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is, that, that's why I feel like this question is quite very relevant because compared to a, a well-established company, uh, and a starting off social enterprise would find it difficult to actually uh, meet the requirements, meet the, the needs of its employees or its part-time employees. So it, it's, it's important to remember that social enterprises have to constantly innovate on their model, on their business model, and how are they going to actually uh, meet these needs of their employees, uh, the their beneficiaries that they have planned this whole social enterprise after. So I have another one more question. I really want to take this question. Can I please take this question, Ms. Uh, Karina? Okay, so uh, just in, uh, in, a, in one minute or two minutes, can someone please answer this question? What do you think are some of the weaknesses of social enterprises in Malaysia in terms of capacity and capabilities? What could be the solutions? Is I'll take it. Minutes? Okay, thank you so much. So I think uh, 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 many, SC, many people who want to start SCs are thinking about uh, coming on to coming onto the... Uh, uh, ecosystem with the, with the mindset that we can apply for grants and uh, and uh, you know uh, grant is the mentality like most of this uh, for most of these people you know you don't you they overlook the sustainable sustainability part of it that a business it's a business after all right it's business with social social mission you know if they can if they can strengthen the uh, the uh, the element of uh, revenue through uh, uh, their business activities and uh, define their scope uh, in terms of the social outreach then I think uh, uh, they really shouldn't have have any uh, any issues about excelling. You know, uh, other problems will come come and go as a business along the way. And uh, if you have a strong foundation, you can certainly you know take it through. Then then comes things like grants and uh, and external external support. The grants should not be the main uh, main reason for why you are starting your social enterprise. Then you might as well just start an NGO, and not not in social enterprise. So I think that's the short answer I can give you. Yes. 
So thank you so much, Mr. Seelen, and uh, thank you so much to all our panelists today for all your answers. It's very insightful to listen to you and to know actually the scene and the, the actual situation of social enterprises in Malaysia, the, your struggles and your achievements, and how have you transformed your social enterprise and became a social innovator. So I would like to just uh, project the LinkedIn account. Um, Uh, sorry, one minute. Uh, sorry, Ms. Karina, just one minute. Yeah, I'll just project the LinkedIn accounts because there was a talk about uh, Ms. Zarina saying that she's read an, an article. So I just want to make sure everyone is able to get connected to our panelists today and see our post and uh, see the movements that we, we are supporting at the moment. So just give me one minute. I'll get that sorted. Okay. So. Yes, so these are our LinkedIn accounts. Please do uh, find us on LinkedIn and help and try to connect with us. We will be more than willing to expand our network as uh, we are the Malaysian chapter uh, of Catalyst 2020. We want to make sure that we have a very vast and diverse network that we'll be able to tap into in the future for future projects. Uh, something that I realized was consistent among all our panelists just now is that every single project that they ran would not have been possible if they did not uh, connect with the right people at the right time. Uh, like Ms. Zarina's food aid, if she was not able to find those 1,000 uh, 1, people, she would probably would not have been able to uh, conduct her event effectively. But through her networking skills, she was able to connect with the people in need and respond to their needs in time. So just giving you, just giving everyone a minute to look through the LinkedIn accounts. And I will ask uh, Karina to then share her screen for our survey, our exit ticket survey. We would like to know your feedback on uh, the session that you've attended and how can we improve further so okay so i will stop stop sharing now and over to miss karina So yes, this is the feedback survey and also please do consider to join the Catalyst 2030 team. Uh, we will be more than willing and very excited to have you on board to share our experience and network with you further, collaborate with you for our future projects. So, and that is it from us. Please do check out the chat box for the survey link and Yes, it's on, the, it's on the chat box already. Thank you so much for everyone for attending the session today. And thank you so much to all our panelists for attending the session. I will ask Ms. Karina to take a group photo of us. So can I please request for everyone to turn on your video now? And... I think it would be best if Miss uh, Karina, if you could coordinate and tell us when to when to post. Okay, I will go in one, two, three, go. Great, awesome! Thank you, everyone, okay, for joining. Thank you, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the launch of the Malaysian chapter Catalyst Twenty Thirty. We will be in touch with you. Please look out for our posts on all of our Facebook and LinkedIn accounts. And hopefully we will see you soon for our next project. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn.